It's time for the Unex News. Extraterrestrials, time anomalies, dimension, dimensions, remote viewing, UFOs, UAPs, and USOs, ghostly encounters, abductions, Bigfoot, and more. Your end of the week news source for everything, everything unexplained. Here is your host for the Unex News Podcast, Margie K. Hello and welcome to this Unex News special report. I'm your host, Margie Kay, and this evening we're going to be talking to a number of people who are speakers at the Contact in the Desert conference. So we're going to have a few minutes with each of these speakers, and it's going to be a wonderful evening. So thanks for joining me. And up first is my good friend, Craig Campobasso. He's a multiple award-winning filmmaker and Emmy-nominated casting director. He was 15 years old when he started in the entertainment business. He received an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Casting for a series on David E. Kelly's Picket Fences. Craig's casting career spans three decades. Craig directed, wrote, and produced the short film Stranger at the Pentagon, which was adapted from the popular UFO book authored by the late Dr. Frank E. Stranges. The short film won Best Sci-Fi Film at the Burbank International Film Festival and a Best Sci-Fi Film Remy Award at the World Fest Houston International Film Festival. He is currently raising capital for the feature-length film Stranger at the Pentagon. Craig is the author of the four-part book series, The Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga. He's also the author of two best-selling MUFON books, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac, The Ultimate Guide to Greys, Reptilians, Hybrids, and Nordics, and UFO Hotspots, All the Places to Visit Before You Die or Are Abducted. Welcome to the program, Craig. Hey, thanks, Margie. How are you? Uh, great. It's so good to see you again. It's you it's too. been it's been a long time, too long, in fact. Oh, I know, I know, since I was in your neck of the woods. Yes, yes, <laughs> you did. You came out and and premiered the film Stranger at the Pentagon, which was an awesome experience. Yes. And uh, and you also did a talk with that. And uh, you have been a super busy guy. You've got a lot going on. What is uh, your most recent endeavor? Well, the most recent endeavor is uh, I've been working on making a documentary out of the Extraterrestrial Species Almanac over the past two and a half years. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a lot of work. What my goal from the inception was to make a documentary that looks like no other documentary. So when you're watching this, it's an extension of the book. So I actually went to real live people who are um, having face-to-face -face contact with extraterrestrials mm -hmm. who have pictures of them. So, uh, you know, one, uh, one, we went into a remote village in Italy. It was harrowing for two of our producers that uh, went there and, and stayed with him for two to three days, putting them on camera with all the questions, you know, I came up with. Um, and so it's an extension of uh, the information that's in the book. So you're going to hear from uh, people who are having face-to-face -face contact. You're going to hear from hybrids. Not a lot of people know too much about hybrids. You you probably do, Margie, because you know we're all in this phenomena together. Yeah. But there are many ways that hybrids can come into being, and we go through all of that. And we talk to. Uh, we talked to two hybrids, actually, 
um, oh. and yeah, uh, who, who claim to be hybrids. So um, on top of all of that, so, you know, we go through the whole gamut of greys, reptilians, hybrids, and Nordics. I did throw in some insectoid races as well uh, from famous cases like the Allagash abductions, which were the ant beings. So, uh, which is really just fascinating. And um, I, I will tell you, it's like nothing you've ever seen before, even though you're gonna get a gamut of the good, the neutral, and what to look out for, you still are gonna come out with a great feeling with watching this documentary because of all of the people that are participating in it and uh, talking about how the earth is, um, uh, the consciousness is being raised and everything with the efforts of, uh, if we want to call them the star nations, the star people, or however you want to put it. Um, so it's very fascinating. So we are going for the very first time ever, we're going to do a sneak preview at Contact in the Desert on Saturday, uh, June 1st from 6.30 p.m. to 8.05 p.m. And then we're gonna do a Q&A panel afterwards, or a Q&A afterwards, it's really not a panel, but we'll, we'll be there for about a half hour. So it'll be myself, two other producers, um, Paul Hynek, uh, he covers the Men in Black, of course, we all know who Paul is. He's mm -hmm. the of J. Allen Hynek. A lot of people might not know this, but my biological father was also on Project Blue Book, mm -hmm. which is quite fascinating. Um, and uh, Yvonne, uh, Yvonne Smith and uh, Vivian Chauvet, uh, another uh, uh, abductee. And uh, so we're going to have a very nice, oh, and, and uh, JJ and Desiree Hertek as well who are, uh, so all these people are in the film along with many others, but they're gonna, they're gonna be there at the conference. So we're gonna do a short Q and A afterwards um, with the excitement over it. Lots of people are coming really just to see the film. And so they moved it out of a room that held 300 people into a room that holds 800 people. So there'll be enough room for people uh, to actually come and see it. Cause they usually have about 2,500 plus people that come to the conference. Mm -hmm. um, about a hundred of those will be going to the banquet, which is at the exact same time as our screening. Cause oh, they, always have, they always have oh, everything yeah. going on at the same yeah. time. Well, they've so, got like eight rooms going on at the same time, right? Always, or, always. Yeah. So, yeah, so Could there's always, chaos. there's always something uh to see so uh well, so i'm I am, very excited i'm very excited about your film uh i know the the first one the stranger at the pentagon was very well done and i can't wait to see this one we'll, we're gonna have to get you out to kansas city to do oh. a film premiere uh, oh i, I think, would love that i would that totally awesome? love that yeah that was okay. fun we had the best time, didn't we, Margie? We did. We did. We did. And uh, so uh, we'll do it again, and we'll have a bigger crowd this time. Yes. We, we, we've got more followers now. Well, you still had a couple hundred there for yeah. a stranger. That was still a large uh, group. So, you know. Yeah. For Kansas City, that's, uh, yeah. But I think we can get 300 in there, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think that there's any uh change or shifting consciousness as of late where people are more aware that we're not alone in the universe and you know people who are we're still on the fence about that are are now changing their mind and do you think there are also more contactees now than in past there absolutely are more contactees there's actually more people who are having, uh, as it begins, in a dream state, and then, and then they find themselves in the dream state on, on board ships, seeing other people that they know, right? 
or people that that they see on the ship and then eventually meet in person as mm -hmm. well here down here there is a huge shift in consciousness um ever since i wrote the book all shows started um going towards visiting uh all the different extraterrestrial species so i was invited on um ufo witness i uh, the for the last season so i was on all those episodes talking about the races I also did uh, Deep Space, the latest season on Gaia, because they did a whole thing of every episode being uh, dedicated to all the various extraterrestrial races. So people are really finding it more and more interesting. Now, I did a little reconnaissance with my film. I've shown it to people who are totally not into this material and I've shown it to people who are into this material, and I've shown it to people who don't really know how they feel about this material. And in showing it to all those different people, they all said, oh my God, I just now have so many more questions. Right? Oh, I'll bet. And yeah, and this is a film you have to watch over and over and over again because there's so much information and even even the distributor i mean they told me they said man it's just packed and we there was lots of stuff we never heard before and and they're so they're mm -hmm. uh so excited they said this is something you know people will definitely buy they'll buy it on dvd or they'll you know buy it on vod so they can watch it over and over and over again mm -hmm. um but i think it opens people's minds to what's out there you know, before I woke up at age 26, I never thought about what was out there. I was just living my daily life, not thinking about anything. Right. And well, boom, you get catapulted into, you know, this all this material and you just keep gobbling it up and then you start having experiences yourself. So, well, that kind of segues. Uh, into my next question, which I know the answer to, but I'd like everybody else to know, how did you get interested in this subject? Well, uh, when I, like I said, when I was 26, I had just finished uh, working on Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories in the 80s. I was 26 years old. And I say it's when my own amazing story began. I started being visited in the dream state by three master teachers. And I, it, it was interesting because I would see them, I'd wake up, I'd think about them, and I would just feel unconditional love. And then I would go back to sleep and I wouldn't think about it again. And then the next night it would happen and the next night it would happen. Then it kept repeating for two months. And then the next two months that went into four months was i would be in the dream and then i would wake up in the dream which i call lucid dreaming because my soul actually now was where they were mm -hmm. right so yeah i want people to realize that um experience is just not in your waking physical state it, uh, it, it transcends the, the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. You could be having dreams with spiritual beings that are heightening your own spiritual awareness that you bring back with you mm -hmm. into your body. And that's what was happening with me with these beings. And then the last two months was me, the, the same first two processes. Then the third one is I would wake up. I would feel so much love. I feel like almost like I was floating in my bed and then their astral forms would be at the foot of my bed. Right. So uh -huh. I realized that, okay, this is real. And then, then they started me through different processes of uh, igniting my light body. And then I started traveling to other worlds and I started learning from other worlds. Um, and it, it went through many different things over a two year waking process. So I went from, yeah. you know, Dr. Frank used to say, um, you know, Valiant Thor has a, a funny saying that 
we're all going from clods to gods. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's a good saying because it puts it into perspective. So I, you know, so I went from just being unaware to being aware. And of course, when you're aware, you continue to be aware. There's so much more that you can learn. And then around 2014, I had a second spiritual awakening. And what it does is it just bumps you up to the next level of your own evolution yeah. uh, spiritually in your body and in your mind and in your thought processes. So, um, and I mean, it just continues uh, to go and it's up to the person how far they wanna go. I mean, I got to a point early on when I was still somewhere between 28 and 30, well, I was like, wow, I'm so far down the rabbit hole. I'm a little scared, mm, right? Yeah. Only because I, it was of the unknown. So I backed off, right? And I just continued my spiritual practices that I was given by these beings, right? And, uh, and then I could then, you know, continue to move on and, you know, and since then I, you know, I've had many paranormal uh, experiences. I've, uh, you know, I've had many uh, extraterrestrial experiences as well. Um, and the thing is, is for me, it never began with fear. It began with unconditional love. And so that was the thoroughfare through my whole experiences, right? Although I did encounter some of the dark side, which you still uh, have to contend with, but once you know how to, uh, how to stop that, which is, you know, through pa prayer and protection and bringing in the big, you know, the big archangels is, as I call it. Um, and I created a universal seal of protection that was given to me by Archangel Michael. Um, and so I had those little postcards printed up and, you know, so I have them in all of my rooms in my house. All my friends have them in every room in their house. Mm -hmm. and I have mine. <laughs> you have yours. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I'll, I'll bring some uh, to, uh, I'll have a, you know, a book table there. Are you coming to contact? No, I am not. I, am oh. not. I wish I could. I'm oh. speaking at another event at the same time. Okay. Well, we're going to miss uh, seeing you. Maybe next time. Yeah. We'll see. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, I you mentioned something um about this progression, how it has come kind of naturally to you because you came at it uh from a certain vibration. And I think once you start emitting light, once yes. you raise your vibration to a certain point, your consciousness level, you start emitting light, the other beings see that Correct. in other realms, and that's the good guys. And sometimes the bad guys, they don't like that light. They want to extinguish it. So right. uh, good advice on the learning how to protect yourself before you go into um, any yeah. meditation or any uh, attempt at contact. Um, real quick, we just have a few more minutes. Sure. Would you tell about the first time you saw Valiant Thor? Well, I mean, I read the book in the in the 80s and I thought it, uh, you know, I was just very compelled to the book um, and uh, the photos of Valiant Thor, Dawn and Jill just seemed very authentic to me. Mm -hmm. um, I met Dr. Frank, I think it was 2001, something like that, early 2001. Um, and then I, uh, then I started having experiences, um, when I was writing the script and things like that with his vice commanders, right? There's Dawn, Thawn, Teal, and, um, uh, uh, well, they call him Doc, but his real name is Zan, Z-A-N-N. -N. He's the blonde's husband and in, in the okay. original photos so but then when i first experienced him is when i write as when i was writing with all the other master teachers 
uh, the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga books, they come into my body and they share their feeling body with me. So I see, feel, hear, sense, smell, everything as it's being given to me. And I also feel them. And it was way in the beginning when that would happen, I would sob, especially with the created beings and the fully conscious beings. I would sob for sometimes 15 minutes because you can't believe how beautiful they are, right? Mm. So my first experience with Valiant Thor was sobbing for 15 minutes, wow. right? And, and I will tell you when I was pitching it to my, uh, I had just gotten an agent a couple of years ago and I was telling her about the story. And as I, we were on Zoom and as I was explaining who Valiant Thor was, I would see her muscles start doing this and I go, oh, you wanna cry, don't you? And she goes, yes, she goes, I can't believe how beautiful he is. And then I said, just let it out, just let it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. And and it's that, but he he comes to me in um in lucid dreams as well. Mm -hmm. And um with which I find very good. It, it's really primarily the vice commanders. And it was uh, the same with Dr. Frank. When he would go, he would hang out with them, but he would also get to, you know, talk to Valiant and those kinds of things. But um, uh, he comes around when we were finishing the short film, there was a lot to do and I really needed assistance. And I mean, I was sitting right here in this chair. I felt him come right behind me. My body rang with chills for like minutes. And he said, I'm here, what do you need? And I said, these are the things that have to happen immediately or we're not gonna make the Burbank Film Festival because we're having problems with some of the people in the background finishing the film. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will take care of that. And mm -hmm. he was with me for three days and all of it, just everything went and it was done. Awesome. Right, and it was yeah. done. And, uh, and it was the same about making the short film. I mean, I, I shelved it when Dr. Frank passed away, but you know, I was waking up one morning and Teal uh, telepathically talked in my head and she said, look, it's time to make a short film. I want you to start a, a crowdfunding campaign. You're gonna make over a little over $5,000. This is who you call for the camera. And she said this, I want you to start this process and we will do the rest. And as I kept going, everything materialized. You know, I said, mm -hmm. well, I don't want that camera. I want a real DP with a red camera. The very next day, a buddy of mine called and said, hey, my friend's a DP. He loves this story. He has a red camera. He'll shoot it for free. Yeah. Right. And I said, well, we're, we're, oh, yeah. we'll still pay him. But, you know, but anything I asked no. for, I received and they just made everything click and happen. And, yeah. uh, and that's how the story got out there even bigger into the world. You know, so many more people know about Valiant Thor now, um, mm -hmm. you know, that we're where it was just a, a little bit of the niche UFO community. Oh, there's a lot of, out about him right now. In fact, I'm getting ready to publish a book by Peleg Yegan, and uh, he has deciphered all of the books that have come out about him and by him. And it, it's just amazing. So I can't. And, and just so you done. know, just so you know, the books that have his name on it, he mm -hmm. did not write those books. Those are right. all prior Gray Barker books. Mm -hmm. And after I did the short film, when there was uh, when there was this resurgence of him, they took the original author's name off and put Valiant Thor. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, plagiarism of uh, if you get a hold of some of Gray Barker's works, see that. Uh, and the Sarsarian Press, Sarsarian uh, Press has correct. has a lot of that. So, yeah, do be careful about what you read about <laughs> what you read. And well, uh, just, assume just it's, so you it's, know, it's, yeah. Valiant Thor never wrote a book in his life. He was an advisor to Dr. Frank on Outwitting Tomorrow. And that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Well, golly, Craig, unfortunately, we don't have any more time today, but I hope to get you back on again soon. And we'll talk about you coming to KC. 
uh, to do yes. a film premiere. I'd love that. All right. That would be awesome. Thank you so much for You're spending welcome. time with us today. All right. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, Margie. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. Next up is Paul Hynek. He's a Wharton MBA, professor of finance and cryptocurrency at Pepperdine University, and creator of Easy Numbers Financial Projection Software, which has helped thousands of startups raise over $2 billion. Paul introduced the world's first online service with Kids on Stage with Bill Gates and worked with Avatar, Lord of the Rings, Planet of the Apes, and numerous other movies and games. Paul is a grant reviewer for the National Science Foundation and will speak in any language anywhere in the world with two months notice. So I need to find out more about that. Um, Paul uh, is the son of J. Allen Hynek and is building upon his father's Close Encounters classification system to help experiencers demonstrate the objective reality of their encounters. Welcome to the program, Paul. Thank you, Margie. Happy to be here with oh, my with my and, spiritual guide and and your cat. Yeah. Yep. What's what's the cat's name? JJ. Okay, JJ. Well, it's good to have both of you on today. Uh, I've been wanting to be speak to you for quite some time, but you are going to be speaking at uh, Contact in the Desert. Actually, you're the MC, aren't you? No, I'm I'm moderating a panel and have several presentations. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm uh, going to be moderating. We'll just talk about this one first right here, the Legends right. panel. And you got the two Georges there, along with a lot of other well-known people. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fun. What are you going to be talking about at the conference? Uh, so apart from that panel, I have three presentations. One is Ufology 101 which is really a primer for the UFO curious in the crowd. Then I have, as you mentioned, a presentation about helping experiencers who are interested to demonstrate the objective reality of their encounters. And I have a protocol to do that. And then my other talk is about the nexus of UFOs, DMT, and Bitcoin. Oh, Wow, that sounds interesting. Can you give me a little teaser, a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So first, I'd like to replace the term artificial intelligence because I think it's an unfortunate nomenclature with digital intelligence. Mm. Artificial intelligence kind of frames it, I think, uh, recklessly regarding human intelligence so digital intelligence is a different form of thinking, a different form of consciousness even. Um, a lot of people think that aliens, if they're extraterrestrial, may not be biological beings going through the rigorous interstellar space transport, but may be right. artificial or digital intelligence sentinels. Uh, for those who've taken DMT, there's a very strong digital sensation. And I believe in the works of Andrew Gallimore who talks about this sort of digital intelligence. And of course, Bitcoin is a native digital currency. So I think there is a connective, a narrative through string between all three of those. Well, that does make sense, especially the idea that, well, a lot of people who have, are experiencers and have seen ETs say that, especially the greys, right. often act in a very robot-like manner without emotion and yeah. they're just they're doing their job and then when they're done they're gone yeah and sometimes um, without a mouth and all three of these areas ufos and and psychedelics in general and bitcoin have all been vilified by the u.s government because they view all of them as a threat oh yeah i, I guess they would uh because a, a thorough understanding of it might reveal a lot of truths that's right. A lot of truths with they've been trying to keep hidden. Mm -hmm. Yes, they certainly have. Speaking of, have you had any problems with government uh, surveilling you or tapping your phone lines, keeping tabs on you? If the government is surveilling me, they're doing a better job than my observational capabilities because I've not noticed anything. Okay. Well, you're one of the lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> like, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. But I, I just want to give a shout out 
to our wonderful three-letter government agencies. You're doing a fine job, fellas. Fine oh, yes. work. Absolutely. Yes. Keep the bad guys at bay. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned, uh, or I, I, I was looking in your um, bio here, that uh, you will uh, speak in any language anywhere in the world with two months notice. Does that mean it only mm -hmm. takes you two months to learn a new language? Well, um, so I'm a, I have a passion for languages. Uh, and I've lived in France and Japan. And I've learned smatterings of a bunch of languages. And I spoke in Argentina in Spanish. And what I realized when I went to Argentina, they said, look, you'll speak for an hour and we have an interpreter for you. And I thought, well, that will cut my time in half and really kind of sever that direct connection that I make with the audience. Mm. So instead, I wrote a speech in English, which I don't usually write it all out, translated it into Spanish, and then had three native Spanish speakers help me really get the translation up to snuff. And then I read that in an animated fashion and it went over very well. And so I realized having learned other languages, including like Thai and, and Mandarin, which are which have tones, which are very difficult for the Western ear, that I don't need to be fluent in the language. I just need to be able to read it understandably for the audience. And so I think it's just a much more interesting thing, both for me, and it's a very respectful thing for the audience. I think that that is a fantastic idea, and I'm going to steal that <laughs> <laughs> for the future. Uh, golly. Well, I'll tell you what. Since you're the son of J. Allen Hynek, I must ask the question, what was it like being his son? So I'm, I'm one of five children. And, um, you know, Margie, I think however you grow up, it, it's normal to you at the time. And it's really only in hindsight that you look back and you say, well, that was good. Oh, that wasn't so great. Uh, we had a fantastic home. I had a very fortunate childhood. My father, you know, for those of us in these kind of fields, we people view him as a UFO guy. That's not how he saw himself. He was an astronomer. He was a scientist, a professor who had sort of a, a late in life side gig of UFOs, but he didn't really okay. define himself that way. So we thought of him as a professor. So he's always teaching us things and inculcating the wonders of the universe, such as eclipses, which we just saw as a family recently, yeah. um, and just the scientific method in a, in a way to approach the universe. So it was, it was a very fortunate childhood. Oh, gosh, it sounds like it. it sounds fascinating. Uh, the, and, of course, the universe is, is fascinating, and people who are mm. in ufology believe that we're being visited by some type of intelligence, perhaps extraterrestrials. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think, and we can sort of break this up a little bit. Is there a phenomena or is there enough evidence to suggest that there's something as my father called meta terrestrial happening? In other words, are there enough credible reports by credible witnesses who corroborated often by radar, et cetera, that there's something happening beyond our known understanding of conventional terrestrial technology? And I think the answer is a resounding yes. Okay, so there's something happening. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's extraterrestrial, being you know spaceships from other planets. Mm -hmm. It could be. But I don't think, and Jacques Vallée and others don't think, that extraterrestrial is the answer to all of the phenomena. It could have a lot of different causes or origins, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, some type of collective unconscious. It's a very, I think it's kind of an onion layer of an enigma that will peel back slowly. Um, but I think extraterrestrial may be part of it, but certainly not all of it. I, I agree 100%, mm. especially when people describe seeing a, a portal open up and something come out and then the portal closes behind it. Yeah. Uh, the door in the sky. That's just, it, it's so strange, but more and more people are reporting it lately. Yeah, my it's, father called that the Cheshire cat phenomenon. And that huh? there are other things that seem to suggest that these craft aren't following our understanding of physics. So he leaned a lot towards an interdimensional hypothesis. And 
To me, that answers two of the most vexing questions. If they're extraterrestrial, first of all, how do they even find us? You know, if, if, we, if we reduce the size of the known universe to say the continental United States, on that scale, we're far smaller than a speck of dust in Kansas. So even though we've been beaming episodes of I Love Lucy out into the heavens low these many decades, it's non-trivial just to find us tucked away in this little Milky Way galaxy. And if they come all this, and why would they care? Why would they come so far to see us? I don't know that we're that exceptional. So interdimensional means that they are here or here adjacent or with an asterisk, and they may well be related to us in some way. So to me, it answers the two biggest questions. Have you ever seen a UFO? Not that I would, I would, I would say no, if I use my father's sort of rigorous threshold for what a UFO is. Um, okay. You know, there were daylight disks and nocturnal lights and close encounters, first, second, third kind. I've seen things in the sky. I didn't know what they were, but I'm not what I would consider a very trained observer. Um, and like my father, you know, if I see a saucer land in my backyard, I'm going in it. I'm going to go for a ride. Absolutely. But yeah. if I can add value to this field, it's less from anything I might see as opposed to patterns I might help tease out or connections I might make. I, I'm looking at your uh, bio because I wanted to ask you, uh, when you worked on uh, Avatar, Lord of the Rings, things like mm -hmm. that, what, what was your role in, in that? I helped run a company called Giant Studios and we did what's called motion capture, which is a type of visual effect. And you may have seen this where people wear the black spandex with the little markers on them. Uh -huh. And so we had the world's best technology for that. So for Lord of the Rings, we did Gollum. And that was, I think, the first successful example of a computer graphic character in a live action movie. And wow. in Avatar, all the Navi, if you've seen at one one of the two Avatars that are out now, yeah. you have like the nine, 10 foot tall blue Navi. Those are all done via motion capture. And we actually developed something called the virtual production pipeline so that as you see the actor and they're in the black suit, if you've made those digital assets beforehand in a monitor, you can see their digital character moving in sync with the real character. And you can oh see gosh. the world of Pandora through what we called a virtual camera. So we did lots of movies and games. And then after Avatar, we sold our company to James Cameron. Oh, oh goodness. Well, I I, I would be fascinated to see that uh, in in uh, uh, use. Mm. <laughs> that, that just looks like it'd be incredible. Yeah, it was really cool stuff. Yeah. So what's uh, what's coming up for you new besides the Contact in the Desert Conference? Are you have any other plans? Yes, um, I'm a big Bitcoin and cryptocurrency fan, and these are fantastic times. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this is going to be a very big year for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, unfortunately, very optimistic about the U.S. economy and our fiat currency, and that's a, maybe a little bit far afield from what you'd really like to talk about. So I'm spending a lot of time on cryptocurrency. I'm very interested in DMT. And there are a lot of podcasts and interviews coming up in advance of Contact in the Desert. And then after that, it's summer vacation. And then I may be going on a cruise as a speaker in September. And I'm going to speak in Bulgaria in October. If you're talking about the Contact at the Sea cruise, I will be speaking on that cruise. So I will see you there. Oh, cool. Awesome. That That's going to be awesome. I love Alaska. Uh, it's uh, out of the seven cruises I've taken. That's my favorite. Oh, and cool. We got to see the Northern Lights, so hopefully we will again this time, along Excellent. with a few uh, UFO friends. We could call them in. That's right. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right. Well, uh, do you have anything you want to leave us with today? No, I think that was it. That was really nice talking with you. Okay, you too. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day. And say hi to Thomas. Will indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. My next guest this evening is Thomas Jane. He's an actor, director, and producer working on 
in Tinseltown for over 25 years. He's a triple Golden Globe nominee for the comedy series Hung and has starred in such classic genre films as The Mist, Deep Blue Sea, and The Punisher. He directed and starred in the hit sci-fi series The Expanse. Jane won critical acclaim for his role as New York Yankee baseball legend Mickey Mantle in HBO's 61. His credits include Boogie Nights and Stephen King's 1922. Thomas Jane's production company, Renegade Entertainment, has been prolific since launching in late 2019. Thomas Jane recently completed his nonfiction book, A Human's Guide to Advanced Visiting Aliens, a combination of cutting-edge scientific insight, exospeculation, and an incisive, unflinching review of the human condition makes a human's guide indispensable for ufologists, futurists, humanists, anyone with a king, keen interest in the human animal and where we may or may not be destined as individuals, as a society, and a species. Welcome to the program, Thomas. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, you sound like such an interesting person. I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> and and we're you know we're talking because you're going to be speaking at Contact in the Desert coming up. But I've got to ask you this question. Uh, obviously, you are an actor, a producer, director. How does a person like that get interested in aliens? Wow. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of different routes that were that people take up. My interest uh, comes about 12 years ago, I'd say. Jeez, maybe I don't even maybe it's longer. But what was I'm glad that it happened when it did, because it was a few years before the 2017 New York Times article that kind of changed the game. And we're uh, us who are interested in this subject are living in a little bit of a new world here. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is opening up, you know, uh, for the first time, um, academics are now, you know, not being so gun shy. You know, I mean, it, it's true. We still can't get any grants to study UFOs and you, you can't take a course in college. Um, but uh, the, we're getting some new blood into the field. You asked me what my interest where my interest lies mm -hmm. i had an experience i had an experience that i couldn't explain oh. um i think a lot of people come to it that way you know and i've only been to one other ufo convention this was years ago they had it out by the los angeles airport um i actually met linda moulton howe out there we kind of hung out together and and uh, uh thought that um I thought that they were a bunch of weirdos, but I, I, uh, I realized that a lot of those folks are there because they too have had an experience they couldn't explain. Mm -hmm. Indeed. That that's usually, uh, sparks the interest. Do you mind sharing what your experience was? You know, I don't, I'm not, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a sacred private Okay. Uh, kind of a, it's almost like a religious experience when you sort of look at it in hindsight. So I don't talk mm -hmm. about sort of what my experience is, at least not yet. I'm, I, I think I might, I, I've written it down, you know, as, as clearly as I could remember it pretty, pretty close to after it happened. But, um, you know, I think what's more important is that the people are having these experiences. They can't explain them and it sends them down this rabbit hole. And I was what was shocking to me was how much real uh, dedicated, you know, uh, researchers have done uh, the, the in other words, there's a signal within the noise there that surprised me uh, that the signal was much stronger than I expected it to be. Well, there, yeah, indeed, there are a lot of people who have had experiences. I'm among them, so ah. I, I completely understand what people are going through when they have an experience they can't explain, and it completely changes your reality and your thoughts about the universe when that happens. It breaks open everything, and it really gives you a perspective on the human sort of fish lens, fish eye lens that we view reality from you know we have this consensus reality that we all share 
And when you've had an experience like that, it kind of cracks the lens a little bit. Nothing's ever the same. Yeah, there's there's a lot more to reality. The Why don't you uh, give us a little bit more information about your book? You know, I wrote the book just as a collection of notes that I would take during my my rabbit hole uh, journey. Mm. Um, a human's Guide to Visiting Aliens. You know, I, I, for me, it, it for it was learning about it. There's, there's so many different facets to the subject, you know, and there's so many different researchers who focus on different aspects of the phenomenon. So for me, it, I'm coming from, you know, a storytelling background and a humanist perspective. I wanted to know what does this mean for humanity? You know, if obviously we don't have all the answers. And in fact, some of our answers are dead wrong. And we're living in, that, in a world that we've constructed based on the people that we trust the most, the scientists, the researchers, the people who, you know, write academic papers and stuff. All that trickles down, you know, our, our relativity, quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. These are the foundations that we shape our world with. But obviously, we're missing huge chunks of the puzzle. So I want to know as, as a human being, what does it mean? You know, and like it, take, you know, just asking sort of where aliens are from, right? We, we don't know. We don't have any information about habitable planets. We don't, we don't even know if they come from a particular planet. You know, we only have theoretical ideas about extra dimensions. We have no idea what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, when we, when we say that, you know, but, but the question of, where they're from can be broken down to what kind of reality allows for the qualities that we observe in visiting aliens, right? So aliens can provide us with deep clues about the nature of reality. And that's what, that's where I wrote the book. And that's what my talk is going to be about. It's called when worlds collide. Um, okay. You know, when we ask what's the nature of the world, that aliens hail from, I think that the answers will provide us with information about how our world really works. Um, and we're, we're pretty, uh, we're ready for a new paradigm shift. It's been a hundred years since relativity and quantum mechanics, and we're still wrestling with those and don't fully understand quantum mechanics. Um, but you know, at the end of the 19th century, scientists from the Royal Academy stated that there was nothing new left to discover in physics. You know, all yeah. Things, right? yeah. And they said that about inventions too. Uh, there, somebody said there's nothing left to invent. So it's right. pointless. Yeah. That was and then you, yeah. And then inventions, you know, you find out, I think there's something like 5,000 inventions that the, uh, that the NSA has classified. So pe people are coming up with these incredible machines uh, and if it threatens the economy of the uh, United States, then they they put the kibosh on it and they mm -hmm. they make the guy sign an NDA and he can't even discuss what his invention is. So there's a and that that leads you to the sort of the idea of a breakaway civilization where, you know, somebody is, you know, utilizing some some of these uh, alien technologies. And, you know, we're not privy to all that. No, and it makes you wonder what the government is doing with these new inventions that people come up with that then they classify. Uh, have they decided they're going to use it? And uh, and, and and can they? You know, I, I mm -hmm. recently, you know, um, found a couple of different uh, people talking about the idea that take a, take a, a 30 foot, you know, silver disc that apparently we've got some crashed you know, uh, vehicles hidden away somewhere and even a couple of pristine uh, vehicles and getting these things to work. One of the things that I, fascinate me is that they haven't been able to weaponize those vehicles. Um, in other words, I'm sure that the military would love to have a vehicle that can fly 40,000 miles an hour uh, and, um, and th th throw some bombs on the back of it. But because of the nature of the field that's around the craft that allows mm -hmm. it to do the things that it does, you can't drop a bomb from the bottom of it. You can't 
hook up a machine gun to the to the edges of a of a disc you know the the physics d doesn't allow that to happen so in right. other words they're not you can't weaponize it yet yeah, and then there's always the idea that consciousness is a part of this technology as well. And, that I get uh, into quite a bit in my talk and in the book. You know, uh, just the fact that m most alien encounters um, involve telepathy in some way, shape, or form. What does mm -hmm. that tell us? You know, what does that tell us about the nature of reality? If these aliens have the ability to sort of reach inside anyone's head and read their thoughts and communicate and put put thoughts in there and what does that tell us about co consciousness and then you've got in in our world the mind body problem which still doesn't have an answer you know what came first consciousness or material reality mm -hmm. you get down to the fine point of that and no, nobody has an answer we lean towards materialism obviously right we we're very materialistic but if telepathy is so prevalent, if so many different alien intelligent species have consciousness, then that might tell us, give us deep clues about the nature of reality. Indeed. Do you think that there's going to be any increase in disclosure and uh, forthcoming anything forthcoming from the government you think things are going to change dramatically in the near future i think not that's just my own personal opinion i'm mm -hmm. good friends with steve bassett who runs the uh he's been the spearhead of the disclosure movement for decades now yes and i am and i you know of course we need this work to be done danny sheehan all these great minds who are sort of ham chipping away you know at this at this wall um it, it is all great work and needs to be done but i think that they're gonna fight us tooth and nail for as long as they possibly can you know and that leads you to the question yeah. you know what are they protecting what and that it, the answers to that get deep and multi-layered you know they do that's what uh, ufologists have been wondering about for many years and uh I, when i first got in the field i thought when I was about 11 years old, when I started studying the subject and, wow. uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to figure this out. Yep. No, <laughs> no. Give me a as, weekend. As Give me we a weekend. all think that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we just don't get there, but, uh, you know, there, there, there have been some advancements in, in understanding, I think, oh, especially yeah. as far, as far as those people who have been in contact tele telepathically with extraterrestrial intelligences, or I'd rather call them interdimensional because I think that most of it is they're right here in this space. It's just, we're sharing the same space, just a different dimension. Yeah. And, and, what, and what's the physics of that? You know, what, what does that yeah. mean in real terms? What's the reality of that? You know, what does that tell us about the nature of, of reality and trying to parse trying to parse good information from bad it's a tricky subject you know i i try to stick personally i try to stick with um you know i, I i've collected and analyzed the research of a lot of extremely smart people and uh, tried to apply that to the thinking of ufos and alien visitation uh, mm -hmm. and there's really interesting you know uh, like bernardo castrup who is uh, interested in the sort of the mind body problem, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, we know from morphogenetic fields. What does that tell us? What, what, a, what do humanoid aliens tell us about the nature of evolution? You know, first of all, I mean, it's, it's difficult. The, the micro, there's a, the Reddit microbiologist that came out what, like last year talking about the genetic makeup of some of the beings that he had studied. Now he only, it's, it's one species, right? It's sort of one version of mm -hmm. alien that he studied, but he found that there was a lot of uh, earth. It was sort of a, a, a potpourri of earth-based genetic sequences that has sort of been quilt, like a patch quilt work together of, mm -hmm. of different earths. So Jesus, what does that tell us? What, what if we cracked open these aliens and they all had 
genetic code that we could recognize, you know, is right. that prevalent throughout the universe? Is that a one-off type of thing that they, some aliens make some bio robotic genetic organisms to just, just so they could operate around earth with our sunlight and our pressure and all that stuff. Um, but there are little clues. There's, there's a little, you're right. Over time, we get a little bit more sort of scraping away at the film around the lens of our reality. Mm -hmm. So, and, the, and the matrix. Mm. So, um, are you doing, uh, you're doing the, the talk when worlds collide and what else is coming up new for you? Um, I think me and Steve Bassett are going to do a little workshop at contact in the desert as well. We'll talk oh. about sort of disclosure in Hollywood and the, the intersection of those two things. Um, and then, uh, I'll be finishing up uh, the book. I'm going to try to print up a few copies so I can bring sort of some advanced copies of the book up there. So people can mm -hmm. check it out if they want to. Um, but we're working on that has been my my focus i got i got 90 minutes of material i need to come up with i've been working my butt off doing just oh boiling down what i want to say into an into a into a you know a, a structure that people will want to listen to i'm really yeah. excited about it you know as as an actor i've got to be prepared you know i'm so uh, sure so uh Public speaking isn't my forte, but I'm going to do a great job. I, I can feel it. I, I'm going to wrestle this thing to the ground and and uh, and put on a good show. So I'm excited uh, about it. I'm really excited about it. I'm sure you will. I wish I could be there to see it, but maybe next year. Uh, but uh, if there is a live stream, I think there is. There I'll is. definitely be watching that. Yeah, the live stream, and then I'm sure that they'll figure out a way to sort of disseminate these talks into the mm -hmm. world after the conference. So I, I'm excited about that. Really excited. I'm excited to meet all, some of the guys who have been my heroes in this uh, thing, uh, this, this endeavor, this journey. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to, uh, to get to shake hands with some of these folks and, and just thank them for the work that they've they've done and the, and what it's meant to me in my life. You know, I, I think that's really important mm -hmm. um, to, to hear. So, so I'll, be, I'll I'm re very much looking forward to the whole, the whole experience, you know, I am too. And I'm looking forward to reading your book. Do you have an idea where that's going to be available yet? Not yet. I've gotten it out to a couple of different publishers and I'm not sure if okay. I'll just put it out put it out myself or if you know times are really tough right now i gotta tell you wow even in hollywood like how hollywood is um it's i think it's the most difficult it's been in the last 20 years at mm. least for wow. sort of getting projects off the ground everybody's very gun shy um you know you know you, you, you i paid six dollars for a gallon of milk the other day oh wow so, you know so um that's a bit crazy. It's a bit nuts. Uh, so I'm trying to, yeah. trying to figure out. I'm, I'm certainly not. I don't want to do that. I'll sell my book for it at a price where people can afford it. Not. Um, yeah. Well, that's good. Well, hope. thank you so much for spending some time with us today and letting us know what is going on in your life. And uh, your book sounds exciting in your talk as well. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got to do this. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you, Thomas. You bet. Bye-bye.